Hello, I'm Seth. Welcome to episode one, where we're going to talk about tools and just as importantly, maybe not as exciting, tool safety. This is the first episode of a 15 episode series that we're creating all with the purpose of teaching you how to build your own dream tiny house. And right now we are running a Kickstarter campaign. It ends August 9th. So if you're watching this before then, head over there. And if you feel like contributing something, we would be ever so grateful. Even if you don't want to build your own tiny house, if you just think that this is a valuable resource that should be out there in the world, donating a dollar or two makes a really big difference. If you are watching this after August 9th, you could just head over to our website and you can find out more information about the series there. We are going to sell this series in the end, but it's going to be for a pretty small amount. And if you buy it through Kickstarter right now, it will be for an even smaller amount. So in this episode, we're going to talk about 12 different power tools that we use on a regular basis. We're not going to go into some specific tools like drywall tools or plumbing or electrical tools. We'll go into those further on the appropriate episodes. But for now, we're just talking about 12 and I could have picked a lot more. I just needed to narrow it down. And what we did with these 12 tools is we gave each tool two different ratings. One is a necessity rating and the second is a danger level rating. The necessity level will just be presented to you in the order that I show you the tool. So the first tool that I show you, that's going to be the most useful tool for us to build tiny houses. The danger level, that's based on a 1 to 10 rating system, 1 being the least dangerous and 10 being the most. Now before we actually go into the shop and get our hands on some tools, I want to talk about something that's a little more boring and that's a couple safety things. To make it a little more exciting, you could look down at your fingers and just try to imagine that a couple of them are missing and that is just an example of something that can go wrong with power tools so it's really worth paying attention to safety there's three things that i'd like to quickly touch on that you can't really physically see necessarily but really do affect safety the first one you either have it or you don't unfortunately um, but you can go out there and get it. And I'm talking about experience. If you don't have any experience with tools, I highly recommend borrowing some from a friend or if you know somebody who's working on a project that you can volunteer anything to get your hand on some tools. The more experience you have, the better you can predict the way tools are going to act and therefore the safer you'll be. The second and third thing, they kind of go together and that's being tired or being in a rush. And in the construction business, there's a saying called the five o'clock fluff up. And it really is when most injuries occur near the end of the day. So maybe use the more dangerous tools in the beginning. Um, just try to always be aware of those things. And if you find you're in a rush or tired, and using a dangerous tool, go find something else to do. So there's one more thing I'd like to mention about tools before we head over to the shop. And that is, it really does pay to buy nice tools. Throughout these videos, I will show you lots of different ways to save money, but I highly recommend that you don't do it in the tool department. Couple reasons. One, buying a nice tool, you'll probably get more bang for your buck. It'll last so much longer. So in the long run, each time you use it, it's going to cost less. The second is you will have the luxury of using a high performance tool, which really does 
help everything go smoother. One other thing about tools, it also pays to keep sharp blades on your tools. Believe it or not, a dull blade is the most dangerous kind of blade. Um, you're also forcing the tool to work harder when it has a dull blade. So with all that said, I think it's time we go over to the shop and start using some tools. So here we are in the shop and before I grab my favorite tool, the one tool I would grab before all other tools to build a tiny house, uh, I want to say one last thing about safety. The, the best thing to be as safe as possible is to get your owner's manual and read it all and follow it to the T. If you don't have one, you can usually find one online. So. The tool that I would grab before any other tool, as far as power tools are concerned, is a skill saw. And that is partly because the saw is so incredibly versatile. Um, when I first started learning construction many years ago, all the guys actually put a little wedge in this little safety guard here, and the saw always looked like that and it made it more useful, but it made it incredibly dangerous. Um, so don't do that. With the guard down like that, I am rating this tool danger level uh, a seven. So um, it is definitely a tool that needs special attention and the more experience you can get with it, the better. I will do a little demonstration and show you a few little tricks. So this specific skill saw has a, a depth cut range up to three inches, which is a little bit more than normal. And it just means like from the bottom of this guide to the bottom of the blade is, is three inches. And of course, when you are cutting a half inch piece of plywood, you do not need the blade to be sticking out three inches. In fact, it's quite dangerous. So we'll just adjust that. I usually want it to stick out a little bit, maybe a quarter inch or so, out the bottom of whatever it is I'm cutting. One good thing to remember about this saw is that it actually does want to go straight. Um, so when you're cutting a straight line, just remember that, and maybe it'll help you follow the line. Uh, because the blade is flat, it doesn't want to curve like maybe a jigsaw would. So a really important thing to keep in mind when you're cutting with a circular saw <coughs> is to try to predict what's going to happen when you get to the other side of what you're cutting and the two pieces start to come apart because that is where the tension occurs and either this blade will get stuck or it might kick, kick back. And that's kind of the most dangerous thing about this saw is it kicking back. And so it's really important when you set things up to be cut that everything is supported in a way that it will either stay exactly where it is or the two pieces might slightly fall kind of upward in the middle. What you don't want uh, with any saw when you're cutting is the two pieces folding in on themselves because that really pinches it and causes it to kick back. So as far as cutting plywood, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the other really cool thing you can do when cutting plywood with a circular saw, say you need to cut uh, a window out and you can't access the edge you can actually do what's called a plunge cut and you can pull this guy back and just drop the saw down into the plywood and go along that way. And I'll show you a couple other cool little tricks with the circular saw. So now we're about to cut a 2x6 and 
you could do this a couple different ways. You can measure it and then make a mark and then use your smart square to draw a line and then cut that line. Obviously you want the blade to be on the side of the line that is going to be the waste material. The other way you could do it, which is a little bit quicker, maybe even more accurate, you pull, pull your line, make a mark, and then all you really need is a little tick on the side closest to you, and then you get your smart square and really firmly pinch it to the board, and then you're using that as a guide, and you'll be able to see the blade touch your little line, and you can just go from there, and you don't even need to make a full mark to cut a perfectly square cut. So that's a really good little tip. Coming in at number two is a framing gun. Um, I cannot imagine building a tiny house without one of these. Uh, again, when I first started construction, all I got to use was a hammer and nails, but these days it's amazing how little I use a hammer, uh, sadly. So with these guys, we basically just use two different sizes of nails. We use a three inch nail for all framing, and then basically the shortest you can get is a two inch nail, and that's for all plywood applications. And one thing to be aware of, with all new pneumatic tools, if it says oil next to where you hook up, that means you need to drop a couple drops of, of oil in there every once in a while. So obviously this tool doesn't work without uh, a little compressor. You don't need a giant one to run that tool. This little thing works and you need a hose. Um, the longer the hose, the better, just because then you can keep the compressor kind of away from the work site. Uh, and it's really frustrating when the hose doesn't quite reach. So I would get at least like a 50 foot hose to go with your little compressor. So obviously this uh, is a potentially very dangerous tool. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Lethal Weapon, but uh, you can do a lot of harm with one of these. You're basically shooting little three inch spikes through the air. Uh, so for the, the danger rating, I gave it a 7, and I will demonstrate a few little tips just to, to keep it a little bit safer. So when using the framing gun, really the most important thing is what your other hand is doing. Uh, you really want this hand that's holding the other piece of wood to be back a fair bit. And the other thing to really look out for is knocks in the wood. The one time I did shoot myself, it hit a knock and went flying up the other way and into my hand. Um, and the other thing is you really want to make sure everything is, is very stable and, and nothing's going to move while you're shooting. Typically, framing is done on the ground and sometimes I'll even use my foot instead of my hand and I'll just stand on all the pieces um, that will ensure that your hands stay safe. And next we're going to have a look at number three, the table saw. Here we are at the table saw, and the table saw got the, the highest danger rating for a reason. It is known to take people's fingers. There was one year a while back that I knew of three people that lost fingers from a table saw. And so we don't want to do that. You can see with this table saw, the safety guard is off. There is still, there's still this piece of metal behind the blade that helps keep the wood from closing behind it after you, you cut, and that helps reduce pinching. But the, the main safety guard is off, 
as far as I know, that's how most builders use it. It obviously makes it much more dangerous, uh, but I'm going to give you a demonstration as to how to make it a little bit safer. The, the most important thing to have next to your table saw is a push stick. And usually you can make a homemade one out of plywood that works much better than the one that comes with the saw. So you could probably find out how to do that somewhere online. Now, I just want to quickly talk about blades. Most table saws are a 10 inch blade. And basically, I, we just use two different styles. And one may only have like 28 or 30 teeth. And that's more for general construction, for ripping. And then the other one would be a more fine tooth, maybe 60 teeth. And that is for just finer construction work. Uh, if, you're, if you're cutting like nice plywood or something for finishing and, and you want a nice clean cut, we use these. The other, the other thing that we have but we honestly don't use very often is a dado set. If you want to take out a big chunk of the material, you can use one of these. Now, as far as actually cutting on this machine, this table saw is nice enough that you could probably just read um, the measurements on the table saw, but what we usually do is we actually use our tape measure and put it up against the guide and then measure to the inside of the teeth. And that is how we do it. And then when you actually go to cut, especially if it's something short, you really want to use your push stick. One thing to notice about some woods when you're running it through, you might notice that there is a slight curve on this piece of wood. It's just kind of cupping. And if ever you do notice that, you want to make sure that the cup is down so that the edges of the wood are touching the table saw. Otherwise it will kind of rock back and forth. And to get a really square cut you might find that you want to cut it a little bit large and then cut it again afterwards. So I'll just do a quick cut just to show you. Um, the most important thing with the table saw is always be on alert and paying attention. Don't get too relaxed with this tool it will bite you. One more thing about cutting with the table saw. When you put this piece of wood next to the blade, you can see that the blade is sticking up way too high. And it's just more risk of, of them hitting your fingers. So what we'll do is we'll lower this so it's just barely above the wood, kind of like so, and, and then we'll cut. So coming in at number four are the drills. Now this, if you're not familiar, this one is what we usually call a drill and this one is an impact driver. Uh, I'll go over that first. These are the first cordless tools I'm showing you and cordless tools have really come a long way. Uh, it's amazing the amount of power these tools have. So the impact driver is what is used for basically what it sounds like. It's for driving fasteners. Up here in Canada, we've got most of our screws have Robertson heads and they're a square head that take a square bit. And there's not a huge amount of danger level on the impact, but we did rate it a four because a lot of people do end up basically screwing their fingers or thumbs. And what happens is if your finger or thumb are down below and you're putting a lot of pressure and this thing just jumps out, you can very easily hurt yourself. Uh, one useful tip 
If you are trying to drive a screw and you hear this noise, that usually means that you are not driving it, instead you are stripping it. Um, and the best way to adjust that is just to make sure that the angle of the bit and the screw are all lined up and you're more likely to be able to screw it in. As you can tell, it's an extremely noisy tool, but an extremely useful one. Now the drill, we've actually rated it even higher on the danger level. I gave it a seven, um, but that's mostly if you are using a spade bit, which is this nice wide bit, or a hole saw, or a metal bit going through metal. And the danger point when you're using this is right before it goes through the other side of the material, that's when it wants to bite. And what happens when it bites is the bit or the hole saw stops and the drill and your wrist keep moving. So what will happen is you'll be drilling and it'll bite and this drill will just snap your wrist that way. So, and I, I've heard of many people actually spraining or breaking their wrists that way. So it's really important that as you're using it, you're braced and you're prepared for that. Very quickly, you'll figure out which way it's going to spin so that you can really be ready for it. Extremely useful tools. Now, for our next tool coming in at number five, we're going to look at the chop saw. So here we are at the chop saw. There's really only two main suggestions I have for you. Uh, one is when you cut small pieces. That is really the most dangerous part I find about using the chop saw because if you don't have a firm grip, and even if you do, sometimes things go flying. And so whenever I'm cutting a small piece, you either want to use a clamp. Mo most chop saws have a clamp, but as you can see, maybe that won't reach the piece. Another option is to get a larger piece of wood, and once you have it lined up, put the larger piece on top and use that as your support. And that way you are also keeping your hands further away from the blade. The other quick little thing, if you are ever cutting a wide board and you've got one of these saws that goes back and forth, I suggest kind of using that going back and forth and just kind of slowly working your way down and you're, you're less likely to be cutting and having something bind and having something unpredictable happen. So that's it for the chop saw. It's a pretty self-explanatory tool. So... number six is one of my favorite tools. It's also one of the most dangerous tools and that is an angle grinder. Uh, right now there is a zip disc on here and of course this is a cordless one. You can also get ones that plug in. They're a little bit cheaper but I do find it's nice to have a cordless. It's a little bit safer. You don't have a cord and if this does get stuck um, the battery usually does cut out, so it's an extra little safety feature there. Uh, however, this disc that's on it right now is very thin. It's made for cutting metal. We usually use a bit of metal siding on our houses, and this is the tool we use for that. But these discs can explode, um, so you would never ever use this tool without glasses. Right now we have the safety guard off. Um, that is making it much more dangerous, but a little more useful. The other, you can put many different types of blades on this tool. The only other one that we use quite frequently is this flap disc. It's, it's a sanding pad 
you can get it all the way from 36 grit up to 120 and you can do some really aggressive things you can mold wood um, one thing we use a lot is live edge and when we want to do the front or any kind of wood that's irregular this is what we use to sand it for those reasons we give this tool a danger rating of nine and it is a very dangerous tool so i'm going to give you a demonstration to show you a few ways to use it a little bit safer so here we are with the angle grinder it's got a zip disc on it now but i want to briefly talk about these flap discs because they are more dangerous than they look which is part of the reason why they are so dangerous is you don't take them too serious but i have had these scrape up against my skin more than once and it really hurts so be aware of these as far as cutting with a zip disc i my preferred method is to always have the blade spinning away from me and i'll start the furthest away from me and work towards myself and that way the point at which something unpredictable might happen is closest to me and I can have a really firm grip on the angle grinder because this this tool does easily kick back and that is when things can go wrong so you really want both sides supported it's exactly the same as the plywood you don't want them to fall into each other if anything you want them to go slightly the other way or better yet, not move at all. So this is what it looks like when you're cutting. We're going to start by talking about things that we wear and we'll start with as usual safety first basically the, th the three main safety things you might wear on your head are of course glasses and it's really important to keep your glasses nice and clean i find the dirtier they get the less likely you are to put them on so keep these nice and clean ear gear is super important we're going to use some really loud tools and then we've got a couple different options for masks depending on what you're doing uh, it's definitely nice when you're sanding especially inside you should wear a mask now one thing that people don't really think about when it comes to safety but it really should be thought about is the clothes that you're wearing you really want to wear clothes that are pretty snug fit doesn't have a lot of loose things hanging uh, being comfortable is really important and that's why a lot of times in the winter I do wear gloves partly just for comfort now to talk about your tool kit uh, it really is useful to have tool belts. It'll save you kind of running around looking for tools that you set down here or there. And uh, it really makes working more efficiently. So let's have a look to see what I happen to have in there. Obviously, a tape measure is pretty crucial. And for me, I find the ones that have metric on one side and standard on the other quite frustrating uh, I'd rather just have one that said <laughs> just one because sometimes you're reading from the top and sometimes you're reading from the bottom also something to be aware of it's very cool to have a tape measure that can measure up to 35 feet but the problem is sometimes it doesn't actually fit anywhere so be aware of that when you get a tape of course you need a pencil kind of crucial and you need to be able to sharpen your pencil. I really like these kind of wide Ulfa blades. I find that they are the best knife you can buy. 
Yeah, what else? There's a nail punch in here. This is very useful when you're doing finishing work. You don't need it in there all the time. It's nice to, oh, very important, smart square. This is used a lot. And to be honest, I almost need to go back to college to figure out everything that this thing can do for you. It's uh, yeah, a very useful tool. I won't go into all the different things. You're gonna have to find that information somewhere else because it's just too much. But you need one of these. Another thing that I don't have here today that kind of goes with that is a framing square. We don't use them very often, um, but they are nice to have. Also, a chalk line is pretty crucial. Any kind, any color comes in blue and red and purple and pink and whatever you can think. Everybody has their own preference. This one happens to be blue. Also in here is a cat's paw. I find this is probably the most useful style. It has a little claw to take nails out with, just in case you mess up. And then it also has this nice flat part just for gently prying things. Uh, it's also nice to have a bigger crowbar, but you wouldn't want to carry it around with you. And I also have a little pair of pliers in here. It's kind of useful to have. It can just be a little cheap pair, it doesn't matter. So another thing in here that's quite useful to have is this little multi-driver tool. It has every bit that you could possibly imagine. Um, it's really nice to have one of these in your tool belts. And I almost forgot because like I said before, I don't use it very often, but back here is a hammer. Uh, these are useful and I have just had these hammers for I don't know 25 years maybe and they're an e-swing hammer there's really a lot of different options for hammers it's just a matter of what kind of feels good for you the one thing I'll point out real quick about hammers is there's typically a framing hammer and a finishing hammer and a framing hammer apparently has a more straight claw and it also has a bit of texture on the front to really grip the nail. And you would not want to use this for finishing because that will also put little bits of texture on your trim. So this has got a nice smooth front. So while we're talking about kind of accessory bits that you might need, uh, I just want to quickly point out this Japanese saw. We use this quite frequently. It is really good for doing like flush cuts and a Japanese saw works, uh, it's so thin and it, it, it's allowed to be that thin because you actually pull to cut. Uh, and there's two different sides. There's a cross cut and a ripping side. Very cheap, very useful. And then of course, you're gonna need a level. They usually come two foot, four foot or six foot. For a tiny house, you might be able to just get a really nice two foot level and call it good. Just make sure that you don't drop it. The other thing, of course, you're gonna need extension cords. Uh, I really like um, this one. It has all these different places where you can plug in and it's a really heavy gauge. Uh, they're not cheap, but it's worth getting a nice one for sure. So I think that's it for accessory things. Uh, I'm also gonna show you the ladder that I like and a couple horses that are also very useful. So a couple other things you're gonna need on your job site are sawhorses and a ladder. Uh, sawhorses, of course, you could make your own. And in fact, way back in the day, when a new guy showed up on a job site, a lot of times the boss would make them build a sawhorse and kind of determine their worth on how quickly and nice the sawhorse is. So it is a good idea to make your own sawhorses. I'll tell you one little hint, the magic degree is 15 degrees. Um, however, that being said, you should do that. Also though, these sawhorses that open up and turn into little step ladders, they are extremely useful and worth every penny. Just make sure you don't cut them when you're cutting wood.
And then as far as the ladder goes, this ladder has been great. It, it's really nice because it goes from a step ladder to a normal ladder. So you've got kind of two ladders in one. That's the ladder sawhorse lowdown. Our next tool is the palm sander. And I'm not even gonna put this on the danger rating scale because it didn't quite make it. I've never heard of anybody getting injured with a palm sander. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about it. It comes with these little Velcro sandpaper pads. And we usually just use a range of 60 grit to 120 and that's it. We never go any finer than that. Um, yeah, there's not much to say about this, except when you are using it, um, put your mask on. So coming in at number eight is a jigsaw. And this is a pretty useful tool, especially if you are cutting circles. Um, but you can definitely build a house without one. With this tool, you can either buy a, a blade that is meant for cutting wood or for cutting metal. To be honest, we never cut metal with this tool. Uh, we pretty much just cut wood with it. And you'll notice when you go to buy your wood blades that the teeth either point down or up. And we always buy the ones that point down because they leave a clean cut on the top of the surface of the wood. So that's something to take note of. This is a pretty safe tool, but there is a blade that's very sharp moving back and forth. We're going to give it a three for the danger level. Next, coming in at number nine, we've got more pneumatic tools. These are both finishing guns and of course they'll hook up to your compressor and in fact sometimes you can buy this as a, a kit and save a bit of money that way. The two guns that I have here, uh, one is a 18 gauge finishing gun and it only goes up to two inches long. To be honest if I could choose one of these I might choose this one, it's a 16 gauge finishing gun and the nails go up to two and a half inches, which is really useful for nailing inch and a half wood, which we do use, uh, especially on exterior trim. So I think, you know, these are fairly safe tools. I'm, I'm gonna give them a danger level of, of five. I've never actually heard of anybody being shot by one. And uh, I think if you did, they're so small, you might be able to just pull them right out again. Uh, unlike the framing gun, which um, can really actually break some things. <laughs> now, coming in at number 10, we've got a Sawzall. And you'll obviously notice this is a battery operated Sawzall. I only have this because it came with a kit. I don't use it very often as a battery because it drains the battery so quickly. So you could just use one that, that plugs in. This tool is coming in so low on the necessity level because it's more of a demolition tool. You really could get away with it without having one of these while you build your tiny house. Right now I've got a metal blade on there and you might notice that it looks like it's upside down. That's actually always how I put the blades in. And that's because if you want to cut kind of parallel to a surface, you can get a little bit closer that way. And in fact, you could actually plunge cut with this uh, right into this plywood table, for example. Uh, you can also get wood blades and you can get kind of multi-purpose blades, which cut everything and are very useful. And I'm going to give this a danger rating of five.
Coming in at number 11 is our thickness planer. So I'll give you a little lowdown on that. So here is our thickness planer. We do use this quite a bit during the finishing process, but obviously you could build a tiny house without one. They're just quite convenient. However, they also are pretty big and heavy and expensive, which is also another reason why it got rated so low on the necessity level. I'll just mention a, a couple quick things. Um, if you do buy a, a thickness planer, one thing to look out for is that it has four points where it goes up and down. Uh, I've, I've had many of the other ones and burnt through them all. The other thing is the blades do get dull pretty quick. They're expensive, so you, you tend to put off replacing them. But by doing that, you're putting a lot of extra strain on the machine and it'll burn out a lot quicker. One neat little thing we did, uh, mostly we use this tool outside when we can. It's very noisy um, and does make a bit of dust. We got just a normal garbage pail with a lid, put a four inch hole on the top and then you just clamp that lid down and then stick this sucker in the other end and that collects all your sawdust which we use for good things like compost. So that's the thickness planer. Coming in last but not least is the belt sander. I obviously think that you could easily build a tiny house without one of these but they are useful. Uh, they're a more aggressive sander than the palm sander and it's much easier to get like a nice flat uh, finish with this sander. As far as danger level, I have actually seen someone get hurt with one of these but I'm not sure how they did it. So I'm going to give it a pretty low danger rating level of 2. Now at the end of each episode we are going to do a little experiment that will hopefully be informative and entertaining and on the end of this one we are gonna kind of put some tools to the test. We're gonna cut out plywood uh, on a wall where the windows are gonna be and use a few different tools and just see which one performs the best. So please stick around, watch that and thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and take care. So for this fun little experiment, we have built a mock-up wall and we've put four windows in it that are all exactly the same size. We've put plywood on the wall and now we're gonna cut those four windows out with four different tools and just put the tools to the test, see which one is the quickest, the slowest, the neatest, the ugliest. Um, I get to use my favorite tool, the circular saw, and for that I'm just going to do a plunge cut and then cut away. Duncan is going to use the reciprocating saw and also he's going to do a plunge cut and away he'll go. Rob is going to use the Japanese saw. We've given him some uh, kind of a little bit of a, a cheat. We've given him some slots to put this in so he can get started. And then Brian, the fine woodworker, he's going to use this little router. Uh, I didn't go over this in the tools. It's kind of a luxury tool. It's something we don't use that often. Um, but it is a, a handy little tool. And as you will see, it leaves a very clean cut. He will need uh, a little pilot bit just to get started. So yeah, we will put these tools to the test and we'll share the results. Okay, ready? Yeah. On your mark. Get set. Go!
Oh, he's not done though. What was mine? 33. Second? Yeah. Forty, forty-seven, Brian. Four minutes, fifty seconds. So the first one we're going to look at is a circular saw. You can see why I love it so much. It left a pretty clean cut and it only took 33 seconds and next we've got brian on the router his took 47 seconds and left an even nicer finish but to be honest you don't really need this level of perfection in framing although it is nice to look at and then next we've got duncan's opening he used the sawzall it took two minutes and 10 seconds. It's a little bit rough around the edges, but we need to remember that Duncan's used to working with welding tools and not wood tools. And then last but not least, poor Rob with the Japanese saw. You can kind of tell that that saw was not made for this job. It took him four minutes and 50 seconds and it kind of needs to be cleaned up. So I think to end this whole episode, I'll leave it with this thought. Thank goodness for power tools.